Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and tuning in this weekend. My name is JJ Matai and I'm one of the worship pastors here at Jubilee Fellowship Church. I get the honor and the privilege of welcoming you to our online service here right now. If you're new here and you've never been here before or you're new, a couple of services watching, we would love to connect with you. We're not coming after you, we're not coming to your house. We just want to know you and connect with you to get you more connected to what's going on at our church. If you go to jfc.org new, we have a quick card you could fill out and you even get a gift in the mail sent to you just for doing that. What could be better than that? If you're part of this community at all in any way, we would love for you to be a part of our commenting during the service. It's a way for you to stay connected with other people watching online since you're not in the building, but certainly a part of the whole of the community. Finally, in every way and everything that's happening in our church, we just wanna draw everybody together in whatever way connects you. We have three easy ways that you could give to be a part of the bigger kingdom vision that our church has to share Jesus with people. So however you come here, however you want to be a part of it, we would love for you to connect with us, and I will see you at the end of the service. I trust the Lord, and then with fill in the blank. So we've taught on I trust the Lord with the future, I trust the Lord with my children. Kate Matat taught last week, did a great job. The altars, was that a powerful time? So thankful for, thank you for the four people who clapped for the altars. One more time, the altar ministry was fantastic last week. So appreciative of her. She was bold with that, and your response on that was just, it was wonderful. Uh, Pastor Terry's doing one in a few weeks on finances that I'm excited about. I trust the Lord with my finances. Uh, this one is this, this weekend. I trust God with my unfinished story. My unfinished story. All right, so without explaining that real quick, how many of you would say I have an unfinished story in my life? I, I mean, you can't, like, you can't be an adult and not have an unfinished story. You can be 12 and not have one, yeah. right? You just don't have that many stories at 12. But when you're an adult, there's just some things that have a question mark on them that you're still waiting for God to answer. I'm gonna use um, the story of Hannah and Samuel. It's a really interesting story. You may think you know it, but maybe not through the eyes of a person who was waiting for a promise and had a life that just never seemed to change, no matter how much she prayed and no matter what she did. And so I think you'll find that, uh, that interesting. There are seven fill in the blanks today. So if you want to use the online notes, right, on our website or the notes uh, for everything, and then you can use um, uh, those notes to be able to do the, uh, the fill in the blanks. So Pastor, why, why do that? Why not just sit and listen? I'm gonna say this, man, the weakest ink is still better than the strongest memory. Uh, and I find that to be true the older that I get, right? Writing things down, I can go back and remember it. Trying to remember it, it seems like I alter history when I try to remember uh, things. And so I would just encourage you, take the notes, and we provide it online just to make it easy where you can actually, uh, the program allows you to, uh, to write in and fill in the blank. So uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 talks about a man named Elkanah, a woman named Hannah, and her sister wife named Penina. And I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right, to be honest with you. I'll let you see it. Um, but uh, let me read this story to you a little bit, and then I'll fill in the blanks. Elkanah had two wives. That's always an interesting statement right there, huh? That's why I called it a sister wife. Hannah and uh, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. You realize the Bible, it is so well edited and so put together that in just two sentences, it gives an entire story. The sister wife had children, but the other one did not, right? So it's setting up the story. So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Read that with me. Year after year, it was the same. I think when you have an unfinished story, an unwritten story, something that is, is just got the big question mark on it, that probably is where you find your life at year after year or month after month or week after week or day after day. It just stays the same. It seems like you pray, you show up, you try, you have faith, and it doesn't seem like anything is changing. And I think the reason this story is in the Bible because so many of us relate to this idea. And when I get towards the end, maybe I can pull it all together so that you'll see where the Lord can minister to you in a very specific way. So year after year, it was the same. 
uh, Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. So they would go to church, and on the way to church, the sister wife would taunt the other one. I've got kids, and you don't. What, I mean, wouldn't you think going to church would make you nice? Yeah. What, what is it about going to church that can make people so mean sometimes? I don't know why that is. It should be the exact opposite. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. So we have her story. She wants to have a child. The Bible says that it's the Lord who opens the womb. She would pray. She would ask God. She would not have a child. And it would seem like her sister wife would have more than she needed. And because the sister wife was jealous of Hannah, Elkanah, her husband, favored Hannah. And Penina was jealous of her. So she would taunt her about not having children. And she would just go to the heart of where this woman's desire was. She wanted kids so bad that she couldn't have them and she would pray and she would serve the Lord and yet year after year it never changed. Now, real quickly, maybe you think, Pastor, if this is a story about the unanswered question is having children, I don't have that in my life. I don't want that. I'm not looking for that. This isn't a story about children. It's a story about wanting something desperately, asking the Lord, and it never seems to change. That's the unfinished story. So what do you do when you find yourself in that place right there? So I wrote this down. Here's the first four fill in the blanks. Let me give you four temptations of an unfinished story that every believer will deal with. The first one is simply this. You're tempted to feel that you're being punished when it stays the same year after year after year. Uh, I use myself as an example real quickly. We built this building a couple of years ago. Um, We did it, for those who remember, right in the middle of the pandemic. We started it right before the pandemic. Okay, so it wasn't like, hey, let me in the middle of a pandemic try to build a building. That was not my, I'm like, let me show you how to handle a pandemic. Let's build a building. That was not the idea. I started it right before. And quite honestly, several years before that, the Lord had put it in my heart and I had begun to share with the church that this is coming our way. Eventually it's going to come. And when the time was right, what the Lord told me is don't put any of it on the market. Don't advertise any of it. I'll bring the people to you. And for those who were here during that time, we had a few pieces of property that I, I, I never listed them. I never put them on the MLS. I, we never got anybody to help us uh, uh, advertise it. We had a person that helped us do the contracts for them because there was the legal part of it. But we, it, God brought all of the people to us and their offer, because we never listed it, we never had a price. And they said, what do you want for it? And so I would just throw out the highest number, and people were like, I'll do it. And then you think, I should have thrown out a higher number. (laughs) You've ever been, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And it was just the most amazing thing. During the pandemic, the Lord made it possible. We raised six and a half million dollars in cash during the pandemic. And if you don't think that's a God thing, I will show you right now that it is. Because if I could do that again right this moment, I would do it. And yet, I can't make stuff like that happen. Only God can open the womb. Only God can answer the prayer. Only God can make the impossible possible. So during this time, uh, this great miraculous thing takes place. We get the building built and then literally cross the finish line. And for those who remember, man, we're trying to do it in the middle of a supply chain stuff. Um, I thought I had it timed out perfect, but the supply chain and all the different things that were going on slowed the process down. We end up moving out of our building. I thought I had planned it where we were going to lease it back from the people who bought it, the church that bought it for a certain length of time. And then when we were done with it, we'd move right into our building. But it turned out we had to go back into a school. Remember me joking about like my great leadership after 22 years from a school right back into a school. Wow. Great, great leadership right there. And we were stuck in a school for nine months. And during the nine months, we could only meet on Sunday, not on Saturday. And honestly, a third of our church is Saturday night. And I lost 400 people during that nine-month time period. That's a significant number of people to lose. Plus the pandemic. Remember how the pandemic went? We were going to tamp it down for two weeks. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's what I said. Yeah, right. And then all of a sudden you can't open back up. Do you remember those days? It was a difficult moment. But we finally get the building built. And then literally within two weeks of that, I have staff problems and financial difficulties. 
and still going through that. And during the last two years, man, I have prayed, I have fasted, I have talked, <laughs> I've shared, I've wept. I've gone through all of it. And you know what the conclusion is sometimes? I feel like, God, did I just blow it? Was I wrong? Did I not hear from you? God, are you punishing me because I did my own thing and didn't do what you wanted me to do? Ever been there? Of course, you want people to tell you, oh, no, you're right. You know what people tell you after a certain period of time? Why is this taking so long? Yeah. You're tempted to feel that you're being punished when you have a big question mark on an unfinished story. James chapter 1, 2 and 4, James addresses this issue with a scripture that almost seems impossible to figure out how to do. Unless you realize you can't do it, the Holy Spirit has to do this. So he's writing to a church, how do we know? Brothers and sisters. He's not writing to the world, he's writing to fellow believers. Brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind. So how much is any kind? Any? Any kind. Come your way, consider it an opportunity to really bellyache. And some who didn't read it are like, man, that scripture makes so much sense to me. That is, I can do that. <laughs> Consider an opportunity for great what? Joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect. Uh, the biblical word for perfect is mature. So when your endurance is fully developed, you will be mature and complete, needing nothing. How good would it be in your life to need nothing? And it's not because you don't need anything, but it's because you got everything that you need this way. And you're able to look that way. So this scripture, we read that, and it seems like, ah, consider it all joy when various troubles come your way. I mean, that's either ludicrous, or he knows the secret to something that many people don't know. And so most of us, when we find ourselves in a long period where nothing's changing and we're praying and we're asking and it just seems like that situation that we so desperately are believing God for, especially when we believe we have a word from God on it and it's not happening. After a long period of time, what we tend to think is not, this is so joyful, we tend to think something's wrong. God, why is it like this? Have I done something wrong? Are you punishing me? It's a tough one. Here's the second one. When you've got an unfinished story, you're tempted to think, listen to the wording, that a delay is a denial. A delay is a denial. Uh, Galatians 6, 9. Let me read it to you and then tell you a quick, quick story about this scripture. Let us not become weary in doing what? For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. What does this promise us? It promises us a harvest if we don't give up. And so we tend to believe that when something's delayed, it's God saying no to us. Oftentimes, a delay is not a denial. A delay is a preparation. Something is going on in us so that when it happens, it doesn't hurt us, destroy us. Or how about this? Sometimes a gifting can open a door for you that your character is not ready to keep you inside of. And God is a blesser. He wants to bless you. So you ask him, God, do this. God, open this door. Of course he wants to open the door. But if you're not ready for that, that blessing could become a curse for you. So oftentimes, man, here's the promise. Let us not become weary in doing good. Um, behind this wall, we have a room. We call it the green room. What it is, it's where the staff that is going to be on the platform gathers before the start of the service, and we talk about the order of the service. We talk about, is God giving us any words? Is there anything that the Holy Spirit wants to do? What, what's going to happen, right? And then we pray, and we pray for the service. We're praying for you. It's really, it's a cool time. But in that room, I've got two picture frames with two scriptures. One is Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 8, that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news. Every time before I walk out here, I remember that my job is to preach good news, not bad news. A lot of pastors yeah. preach bad news. Yeah, right. They put people under the law. They put people under, under. 
God has set you free from. So I need to remember part of the call in my life is to preach good news. And then the other one is Galatians 6, 9. Don't grow weary in doing good. And sometimes I will take that scripture and change two words. Don't become good at doing weary. How many people are good at doing weary? How many of you know somebody who's good at doing weary? Yeah, exactly. How many of you married somebody who's good at... Yeah, so we find ourselves... Every once in a while you hear somebody laugh and you know they know at what, what you're saying. It's a belly laugh. It comes from deep inside. Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The, listen, I think that the devil's strategy today for the church... Listen, listen, listen. Please listen. Um... Pastor Terry taught this years and years ago, and it really stuck with me. It's not, um, it's not the words give up, but it's the words give in. So most of you aren't going to walk away. It's like the disciples with Jesus. When Jesus, he, he says this, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And unless you know what he's talking about, that sounds pretty strange, huh? Yeah. And so uh, a lot of the disciples, Jesus had hundreds, thousands of people who were following him. But he says those words, and it says that many of his disciples turned away and no longer followed him. So he turned to the 12 and said, are you going to quit following me too? And Peter says this, where would we go? You have the words of life. Where would we go? I mean, that's, how many of you would say, that's it? Where would I go? He's it. I went one way, burned the boats, and there's no going back for me. This is it. All right, so we find ourselves in that place. So the enemy is not just uh, quit, give up, never go back. The enemy is more give in. Look, you've waited too long, and God doesn't really move that way. And God doesn't really answer these prayers. And God doesn't really. It, it's the original lie. Did God really say? It's the original lie. And if you can agree with the liar, you empower the lie. And how powerful is a lie? A lie is the paradigm that so many people live their lives out of. The problem with a lie is when you've been deceived, it doesn't matter how much truth is hit at you, unless the Lord opens your eyes, you can't see. Does that make sense? That's why when you're talking to people who are deceived, it's not how well you can argue, but it's how the Lord can open the mind to a person. And that's what needs to happen. So in this situation here, what we have, when it's delayed, we tend to think it's a denial. And then you have the enemy of your soul who's just like, see, just give up. Don't, don't contend for this. Don't keep holding on for this. Don't keep believing for this. Yeah, go to church, but just come on. Yeah. Don't be a fanatic. You know what the devil hates? A fanatic. You're dangerous when you're a fanatic. And I'm meaning that in the best sense of the word. Let me give you the third one. Four temptations of an unfinished story. The third one is you're simply tempted to believe if it's difficult, <laughs> it must be wrong. Man, do we live in a funny day today. If it's difficult, it can't be God. If it's difficult, it can't be right. If it's difficult, it has to be wrong. John 16, These are Jesus' words to us. I told you these things so that you can have peace in me. Look at this sentence. In this world, you will have... So let's do it one more time. In the world, you will have... Trouble. But be brave. I've defeated the world. This is no pie in the sky. If anybody told you coming to Jesus will take care of all your problems, they lied to you. Coming to Jesus will give you a new set of problems. You will have an enemy who has a target painted on your back. He will do whatever he can to stop you, to slow you down, to lie to you, to convince you that no promise is worth contending for. He loves it. Go to church, but never get anything. Wow. Read your Bible, but never believe anything. Pray, but never have any faith. Make any sense? So this idea of like, uh, if it's difficult... If it has to be contended for, if I have to fight, if it takes time, then it can't be God. If it takes time, it probably is God. If it's difficult, you're going the right. If everything in your life is the devil patting you on the back, 
Okay, preach. They, who said? <laughs> Here's the fourth one. If you have an unfinished story, you're tempted to ultimately give up trusting in God. Let me read you some of the most familiar scripture. Many people know this. And I'll read it to you and then make a statement that I can't back up. Never mind. I, you know, I'm very funny. And, uh, okay, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Have you heard this? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit or acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths or he will make your paths straight. How many of you have heard that scripture before? So if you go over to in and out and you get the chocolate shake, on the bottom of the cup is that promise right there. So, Pastor, how do you know that? David Melson has told me that many, many times. Guess where we went to dinner last night after I said that in the service last night? In and out, yeah. Um, can't back this statement up with any proof, but only because I know <laughs> two-thirds of my life has been pastoring. Two-thirds of my life. So just think of that statement real quick. So there's a little bit of like, what I'm saying is there's some knowledge behind this statement, and yet I have no way to back it up. But what do you think is the most disobeyed scripture in the Bible? I think it's this one right here, based on myself and dealing with people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. Easy to do until the rubber meets the road. As soon as you don't get the promise, as soon as it takes months, years, longer than you think it should take, then all of a sudden you can't lean into your own understanding. You can't take matters into your own hands. You can't make it happen for yourself. You can't decide what God is doing because you know. You have to stay in that place of faith. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not into any of your understanding. Acknowledge that God is doing this even if it doesn't make sense. And he'll make the path straight. He just doesn't put a sold by date on it. And there's the problem. If only it came with a use by this date. Or the promise won't be any good after this date. Because it seems like so often, especially for significant things, you're believing and you're waiting. So like with the building in particular, it wasn't building this building that was the issue. There's a whole vision with a training center that comes with it. There's a whole dual dream that God gave Chris and I so many years ago in our lives of a teaching and training center that I think its timing is going to be absolutely useful in the world that we're living in. A place where the light can shine greatest in the darkness. What an opportunity. And yet right now, I can't... Uh, I thought that's why I built the building. I thought that would be the thing that we would go do. And that's been the thing that I can't make it happen. And I can get frustrated by it. And I can complain by it. I can deny that God ever said it to me. Or I stay year after year in a hopeful position. Trusting in the Lord with all of my heart. Leaning not into my own understanding. Acknowledging God actually is in charge of the whole thing. And he'll make it happen in its right time. I hope I'm still alive. <laughs> you ever say those things to God like you think that'll get him to move? Like, okay, that, gotcha. There, right there. There it is. Finally figured out the right words. <laughs> I can't prove it's the most disobeyed scripture, but knowing myself, I, it's just easy to quote that scripture, but it's really hard to do that scripture when the rubber meets the road. Let me, um, let me read the next part of this story with Hannah, Elkanai, and uh, Penina um, that kind of shows like, like men have been the same regardless of 
3,000 years ago, 300 years ago, today. Uh, 1 Samuel 1, 8. Elkanah, remember? Penina has been torturing Hannah. I've got children and you don't. They go to the temple, to the church, and on their way there, instead of it being a nice situation, she would just double down. I know you're going to pray, but God hasn't answered your prayers and he's sure answered mine. Just torture this woman. And it would cause her to cry and not eat. And her husband comes up with this beauty. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. And then he takes it one level higher. Isn't that better than having 10 children? You got me. I mean, how many men are hearing that like, hmm, I'm going to try that next time. That's a, that's a gem. The Bible's got a lot of wisdom in it. <laughs> Everybody's good for something, even if it's being a bad example, which is what this is right here. All right, now... So let me tell you where I made this mistake in my marriage. So Chris and I will be married in just a couple of months, 41 years. Uh, yeah, long time. Um, and so we had five kids. The oldest is Ames, who just turned uh, 40. Um, and then we've got Brent and we've got Kate and we got David and Daniel, who are twins. And uh, <laughs> that's one of them right over there. You can, their personalities just totally came. Oh, this will be fun right here. Yeah. <laughs> so Daniel is the one who goes, woo, claps. And his brother's like, oh, you got dad's attention. Why did you do this to us? Uh, so like, I will, yeah, I'll just, and, yeah. Is that what he said? Yeah. Stop. David goes, tells Daniel, stop, stop, before dad gets over here. Okay. Um, so, uh, and the boys are 31, so nine-year separation, right? And Chris and I made this decision early on in our marriage. Um, and if you didn't do this, you're not wrong. We're not right. This is just what we did. We decided we wanted our values uh, from ourselves to be put into our children. We didn't trust anybody else to do that. We wanted to be the main force behind that. So we decided, hey, you stay home and be with the kids on a day-to-day -day basis. And now you might go, hey, pastor, I wish we could do that, but we can't. This is, I'm, I'm preaching good news, not bad news. Okay, so don't, please. Just, I get it. It didn't mean that we had to make several decisions. Chris and I didn't buy a house until we moved down here to start this church. We lived in less than ideal situations. We had one car for the longest time. We got our second car when somebody had mercy on us and gave it to us. A 72 or three Pontiac Le Mans. What a car that was. Had the crank windows. They wouldn't roll up. I've told that story. So when the rain would happen, it just flooded the inside of the car. You'd accelerate, the water would go to the back, you press the brake, the water would come to the front. And I gladly did it because we knew what we were sacrificing for. Just listen. Just, it, it was what we felt like the Lord wanted us to do, and we feel like it paid off in spades for us. Just huge. And then, um, when the boys graduated, and uh, Dan went to YWAM, Dave went to university, it was, life changed. It was that, that point where our lives changed. The, the, the page, the chapter changed, and there was no going back to that. And in some ways, it was so bittersweet. I wept, and I rejoiced. I was so happy, and I was so sad all at the same time. But nonetheless, it changed. And here was the most significant thing that changed. My wife whose ministry had been in our household, came and said, where's my ministry now? And I said, you got me. 
I literally said, you got me. How good it is for you. You're going to be able to give me all the attention you could never give before. We'll hang out. You got me. And instead of her clapping or like rejoicing, it was kind of like that groan. When I read that scripture, it was like, uh, and I'm like, what, what, what is it? And here was the truth of the matter. Chris was called, listen to this, into vocational ministry before I ever was, before we ever met. I was 15 when the Lord called me, but Chris was in the single digits at a camp when the Lord spoke to her. And in particular, called her to be a pastor's wife. And if you don't think that's a call, you do not understand. It may be the most significant call in the church to be a pastor's wife. It's tough. You're in a fishbowl in so many ways. And I won't spend a lot of time there, but she's just like, John, I, I put it on hold. And where do I fit in all of this? And my big answer but then I realized the Lord was telling me, you need to make room for her. Everything's gone forward without her. Not that she didn't have a place here, but it wasn't the priority. That's what I did. But now she has this in her heart, and it's my job to make room. And that meant I had to push some staff back. I remember I have one who told me literally, hey, it's my job to be right next to you. And I said, no, no, I'm pretty sure I didn't marry you. <laughs> and then my judgment on that decision is that Jubilee is a much better place yes. with Miss Chris in her place inside of our church than <laughs> when she couldn't be. But it was my pleasure and it was my job to make sure that my wife was able to fulfill the things that God had put in her heart too. Here's the question. What do you do with your unfinished story? I'm going to read you nine verses of scripture from her story, Hannah's story, that explain exactly what you do. And I want you to pay attention to how Hannah... <laughs> Even though nothing was changing, neither did she change. She didn't give up. She didn't quit praying. She didn't lose her faith. Here's what she did. Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the high priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the temple, the tabernacle. Hannah was deep in anguish. Remember, she's been taunted and she doesn't have an answer to the cry of her heart. She was crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. You know what? God can handle. Look, you're upset. God can handle your broken heart. God can handle when you don't have the right words. God can handle when you feel like you don't have any faith anymore. God can handle it when all you can do is go and cry. Yep. It's okay. I remember when I was a youth pastor in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, our church was an assembly of God church that... It bordered on Word of Faith. And if you don't know what that is, just real quickly, Word of Faith, became it was a prosperity. Uh, they took the Word of God, like, this is it, you stand on this, and it, that's right. But then they, they got into this prosperity teaching that got out of balance. And so we had a speaker come one time who said this. He said, when you pray, you pray one time. And if you have to pray a second time, it's because you don't have faith. Ah, oh. So what does that do? That puts everybody under condemnation. Yes or no? There's no good news in that. And I got what his point was. Like, if you prayed and you believe, okay. But you know what Jesus said? Knock and keep knocking. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep on seeking. How long? Until the Lord opens the door. Until he turns on the light. Until you get your answer. That's scripture. So the Lord can handle it when your heart is broken when you say to him, I don't understand this, this makes no sense to me, the very fact that you keep coming to him is all the proof you need that you have faith. Faith is not some fake, hey, chin up, shoulders back, I can take it. Faith is God, my heart is broken, but I'm still showing up. 
Faith is, God, I don't understand any of this, but I refuse to give in. Faith is that even when there's a big question mark, it doesn't cause me to say that God is unfaithful or that God doesn't care or that God's abandoned me. So she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her, seeing her lips moving, but hearing no sound. So what is she doing? She's so brokenhearted that she's praying from her heart and her lips are kind of moving, but no sound. And so Eli misunderstands. He thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. No, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger. But I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. I was very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Pastor, I'm super discouraged. And so I'm pouring my heart out to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you the request you have asked of him. Thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Look at the change in her life. Then she went back and began to eat again. Then she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah... The Lord remembered her plea, and in due time. Man, how long is due time? No idea. About that day and hour, nobody knows except the Father. And in due time, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. So what do you do when you have an unfinished story? (laughs) No matter what, you keep pouring your heart out. If it's broken, you pour it out. If you have faith, you pour it out. If you're weak, you pour it out. If you're strong, you pour it out. Keep going to God. Keep knocking. Keep seeking. Keep asking. Pouring your heart out is proof that you trust Him and not yourself. After you pour your heart out to the Lord, what do you need to remember? Let me give you these three things real quickly. Once you pour your heart out to God, remember this. Remember what He has said. Guys, I have said this, I I pastored here, this is my 26th year, I've said this for 26 years, I journal. I'm not a big writer, I've never written a book, but I journal. Why do you journal? I write down the things that I believe God has spoken to me, and then I go back and remind myself all the time, God said this, God said this, God said this. Because when you don't have that, listen, without a vision, people The word vision means prophetic revelation. If you have no revelation in your life of what God is doing, you will perish. You will not have any forward... Am I making sense? Do you understand? You've got to have prophetic understanding. Why are you here? What is God doing? Where are you going? What are the promises of God in your life? I can tell you what they are in my life. But I don't want you to believe for me. I want you to believe for you. I want you to tell me what's God saying to you. Write it down. I use on my phone, if you have an iPhone, there's the notes little app. Use that. Pastor Jake showed me this really cool app that you you can write everything down in and it costs money. So I went back to notes because it's free. (laughs) I have a file in my desk, a manila folder that I wrote on it for God to answer. And when I have things that there's no answer to, I put it in that file, and then I go back and open that file, and I pray those things to the Lord. The Bible says, put him in remembrance of what he said. Not that he ever forgot, but you know who needs to be reminded? So I remind myself, God said this. It's amazing when I pray what he said, the faith that rises up in my heart. Okay, after you pour your heart out to the Lord, what else do you need to remember? Remember what God has done. 2 Timothy 1.6. Look at this sweet scripture that Paul gives to his protege, Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor. Paul is 
an experienced believer. And he gives Timothy this really incredible piece of advice that would be good for every one of us. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So what is he saying? You've got to remind yourself who God is, what God's done, what God is saying. Remind yourself of the things that are inside of you. If you don't remind yourself, nobody else will either. What we want is for people to encourage us and tell us. You know one of the biggest skills you need to learn in this life? Learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. If you need everybody else to pat you on the back so that you're okay, what I have found out is this. In the beginning, everybody's excited. But after two years, all people want to know is, why is this taking so long? And I have no answer for that question. I have no idea why. If I could do anything about it, I would. But I can't. So all I can do is stand up here in front of you, tell you the truth, and show you that I'm okay. Yeah. All right, could start crying. Which one would you <laughs> prefer? <laughs> Remind yourself. Fan into flame the gift of God that's in your life. And this is the last one. <laughs> After you pour out your heart to the Lord, what do you need to remember? Remember who God is. Give me one scripture that encompasses everything there is about God. Anybody? One scripture. And if you're here last night, don't even try this. <laughs> Joe. Sneaky. Anybody? Who said that? My son said that. Right on. Very good, son. Revelations 22, 13. Who is God? I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm bigger than. I'm greater than. I'm over all. I'm under all. I'm your God. You're my son or daughter. I'm faithful. Even if you're not faithful, I'll remain faithful. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. I'm the first. I'm the last. Remind yourself who he is. Because my faith is not in this world. And it's not in an election. Sorry. I have hopes. But I'm no foolish person to believe that's the answer to my salvation. God and God alone. Yes or no? Let me give you two things that I practice. I'm trying to pull this together for communion. Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. I bet you know the scripture, but let me put it in a way that might help you take communion. Uh, worship team, if you want to come on and get in your place, it'll make the transition easier for all of us. Philippians 3, 13. Brothers and sisters, so he's writing to believers. I have not achieved this. Guys, listen to me. What he's saying is, I've not mastered this. I'm still practicing this. What's the old cliche? Practice makes, practice does not make perfect. Look at me. Practice makes permanent. If you practice the wrong things, you will just become good at doing the wrong things. Yay? Nay? If you're a golfer and you never take a lesson and all you do is go out and swing at a golf ball, oh, you'll get something. But it won't be good. You'll get grooved at swinging the wrong way. And then you'll pay big money to get somebody to retrain you. Because you didn't learn it the right way. So what Paul is saying here is, I'm still practicing this. I'm still trying to learn this. Here's what he's trying to learn. I focus on this one thing. I forget the past. I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Right, so let me tell you how I practice that in my life. I cannot wake up in the morning and try to figure out what kind of day it's going to be. If I start that way, I'll tell you exactly what kind of day it's going to be. It's the kind of day where the enemy's going to dictate to me, here's what's happening today. I have to decide before I get out of bed what kind of day it's going to be. Am I going to be full of faith? Am I going to believe God? Am I going to still stand? Am I going to be kind? 
Thank you for cheering me right now so much. I'm trying to teach you something that's really powerful. We walk by faith and not by sight. You strain towards what is ahead when you let go of the past. You begin to do things like this. Here, listen, I ride a motorcycle. Uh, for those who know this, um, this motorcycle is not like a bicycle. You want to turn a bicycle, just turn the bars. But a motorcycle weighs a lot. It's got a bigger velocity. If you want to turn it, you have to move your head and look where you are turning. The number one way people die on a motorcycle is they get headlocked. They turn without turning their head. And the bike ends up going out of the lane, off the road, into the guardrail. You have to turn where you want the bike to go. Look at me. You got to turn your head to Jesus if you want your life to go in the direction that I'm talking about right now. If you sit here and you amen me and you clap for me and you applaud for me and you agree with me, but you don't turn your head and do this, you will leave here and crash. You will not get anywhere with this. If you've got these, grab them. If you need them, raise your hand real quick and we'll get them to you. We've got over here, yeah, several. You can keep your hands up for a minute, please. We've got several people doing this, but it'll take us just a moment. Please keep your hands up so we can serve all of you. Yep, yep. Give us just a moment, several of us. They're getting to you. They're coming from the back here. Here, here. <laughs> Our ushers are really good looking, but slow, guys. And so, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Give them a second. There's just many of you that have your hands up. Anybody else? You want to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Good to go? Okay, listen to these words. Jesus said, do this to remember me. Literally, <laughs> look at me. Turn away from everything else and turn your head towards me. When we take this, this should never become, hey, we do this because this is what the church does or I've taken communion a thousand times. We should do this every time. It should cause our head to look exactly where Jesus is and then our life follows what we're looking at. Does that make sense? So when you're taking this today, Maybe you have an unanswered question that I didn't even come close to addressing. Maybe you go, Pastor, if you knew what my unanswered question is, you wouldn't be quite so glib. You wouldn't laugh. You wouldn't joke. Maybe you've lost a loved one and there's just a big question mark on it. Maybe you lost a child. And there's just a big question mark on it. Maybe it's a health issue. And maybe you're praying and you're praying and it never changes. Maybe it's a wayward child. And year after year, it's just the same. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it is financial. Maybe it's betrayal. It's funny because we think that when we love God, somehow it's a force field that will keep bad things from happening to me. And yet Jesus says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. I'm not. 
a force field to keep those things from coming your way. But fear not. Be brave. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And then he's so bold that he writes the end of the story for us so that we know even going through all of the hell, we're going to win. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, we'll win. There'll be an answer to the unanswerable. And the tears, he himself is the one who will dry them. And the things that simply don't make sense, on that day, one of two things. Either heaven will be so much greater, or the Lord himself will give you the comfort that you need. But you won't always be in the position that you're in right now. And what we really hope is that at a time when we come to the end of the message that the pastor will pray and make it all go away. And if I could, I'd do it. Don't you know that? I think every pastor would. If I could do that, I'd answer my own questions. I'd solve my own problems. No. What I have for you today is turn your face fully to the one who has the answers. Renew your faith again. In the back when we were praying for you, what we prayed is not, God, take away everybody's problems. God, strengthen everybody's faith today. Let us walk out of the building even if we're not going to quit, we're not going to give up, we're not going to give in. We're going to keep believing. And we're going to stay in that position. Where would you go? He's the only one who has the words of life. Uh, if you've not done this before, it's two parts, the bread and the juices together. So open the bread first. Pull the foil back. Take the bread and hold on to it. Don't eat it. We're going to do it together. And then if you'll flip it over and go ahead and open the foil so that the juice is ready, but don't drink it. We'll do it together. So the Bible says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, at the Passover meal, he took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body, take and eat. He said, when you eat this, you're bringing into yourself who I am. You're reminding yourself of my promises. You're remembering who you're waiting for. You're remembering what you're waiting for. Father, I want to thank you today for your faithfulness to me, to every person in this church. Your word is true. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. It may look like <laughs> you've forgotten, but you don't forget. And Father, it's difficult sometimes. It just hurts. We don't always know the why and that's why we've got to turn to the who who is God he's the alpha and the omega he's the first and the last he's the beginning and the end father thank you for your faithfulness we turn our faces fully to you Father, give your peace today. Let's eat together. The Bible says in the same manner, Jesus took the cup. He lifted it to the Father. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you. The very word covenant means to cut. A promise in the Bible 
was an oath with blood. Jesus has promised to us, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I hold you in my hand and no one can snatch you from there. Even if you are unfaithful, I will remain faithful to you because I can't deny myself. It's literally what he said. He said this covenant in his blood is a better covenant because it's based on better promises. He's the one. And I pray today, what you need from the Lord, you'll take into yourself right now. And that it'll strengthen your faith. Strengthen your heart. Let's drink together. Okay. Before you take off, worship was the three songs up front and then I asked Jay without telling him what to do. I just said, would you pray about what song to end our time with? And here's what this is. I'm trying to pull it all together that we need to turn our faces back to the Lord and that when we celebrate communion that God wants to truly speak to us and remind us. And so if you just need to sit or you want to stand but before you leave I want to impart this gift to you. God's peace is in this next moment right here. And I want you to receive this in your life. Let the Holy Spirit do this in your heart. JJ. Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for watching our service and being a part of this. I personally hope, and all of us from Jubilee Fellowship Church, hope that God connected in your life and met you right where you are this weekend in this service. Like I said at the beginning, just because you're watching online does not mean that you're not part of the whole of the community of what our church is doing, and we are so grateful that you're a part of this. So, before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we hope to see you next weekend. Have an awesome week.